Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello, welcome to Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. Today on the show, I have Harold Geller, a well-known lawyer in the area of basically suing advisors, I don't get a better term, but representing clients when advice goes wrong. And that's exactly what I brought him on to discuss is when do you know, or when can you, what should you be on the lookout for to know that you're dealing with the wrong person? And when is that wrong person actually breaching their requirements or obligations to you? And with that, here's my interview with Harold. Harold, thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. I look forward to our discussion. Before we get started, there is one thing I want to address. And, uh, you know, despite the fact, as I joked, you're the kind of person that sues people in my career path, um, not me specifically, otherwise we wouldn't be chatting. <laughs> but specifically, I mean, one thing I want to clarify is you're someone who actually sees the value in planning. Like we've had this discussion before. You've seen, you see the value in creative, in comprehensive planning. And I think it's an incredibly profound thing for someone who's seen the worst side of this industry on a regular basis to say that. Can you speak a little bit to what it is you see that you think is a value? Yes, uh, I'm pleased to address that issue. Uh, the best financial planners are as important to our community as the best doctors, the best lawyers, and uh, other professionals. In fact, financial planners are probably with most high net worth people for a longer period of their lives than a transactional lawyer would be. So they have a greater value. They ha- should be looking at a number of things. First of all, what your uh, assets are, what your debt is what your spend is, how you can improve those uh, three criteria, and then planning into the future, looking at your objectives, your goals, and your risk tolerance, helping to guide you through what can be a very complex uh, planning exercise, as well as helping to introduce you to suitable products that are in your best interest and which would match your long-term goals with what is available in the marketplace. Those skills are of great value to our community. Absolutely. I mean, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, what can I say? I've got a conflict on that one where <laughs> that is what I do for a living. And that is exactly what I believe is of value. So again, when we first communicated, I was quite ple- pleased to see that you saw the value in, in what was what was being done on this end. So that is, I guess that's kind of the first warning sign, right? Like, so the first question I have for you really is, how do you know as a individual consumer when you might be with the wrong person? And I guess maybe the lack of comprehensiveness is something you might say is, is one of the first things you should be looking for? Yes. I'd like to start one step earlier, Jason, and that's with the uh, importance of communication between the financial advisor and the client. This is absolutely essential. If a financial advisor is talking to you in legalese or financially, that's a problem. The consumer is the ultimate decision maker. And if the advisor cannot explain what the the considerations are, what the the recommendation is, and why that's suitable for you in terms that you, the consumer, can understand, then that advisor has really failed in their job. So I start with, does the advisor communicate with you in language that you can understand? A second element of that is whether the advisor talks about the risk, not just the risk of not planning, hope that they're uh, discussing with you the value of planning and looking at the risk, but also the risks inherent in investing. In each vehicle, there are risks, and they should be what a professional talks to you first about, not last as a, uh, as a almost like a PS to a note. These are important factors for you to consider. Sorry, I lost what your question is. Please ask. No, no, that's fine. It was, it was when you know, actually, let me just jump in there. So it's interesting you say, so the first two things being communicating in kind of jargon and the second piece being not discussing risk. So it's funny because more often than not, I think maybe this is a security level that comes with some advisors, is that a lot of people oftentimes think that they're there or they're trying to prove to the client early on just how smart they are and why you should give me the money because you're so smart or the return I'm going to earn. And the reality is when you're when you're out there, for lack of a better term, competing solely on an investment basis and solely on returns, that is the language you have to more or less speak to impress anyone. Where, whereas I agree with you, the if you're not using jargon, speaking in their terms, and specifically focusing on risk, 
that's far more of a planning conversation. And I think it, that's a far more differentiated conversation from a nuanced one from, from what is normal. So yeah, I, I, I generally agree with both those points, but is there anything you wanted to add to that? Or if not, you can- Absolutely, sure. because uh, the, 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 the third element of that is exactly uh, why you and I agree on a lot of issues, which is the value of a financial planning exercise, not just as a snapshot at the time of onboarding of a client to the advisor, but as an ongoing process. And this is particularly important for long range planning, but it also is important for uh, periods like we've just experienced in the last year with the, rela with the relation of, of the financial markets and investments to COVID. If you have a solid financial plan, then there will be planning for downturns, which are going to occur on a cyclical basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, although you can't predict exactly what the cause of the downturn will be, or exactly the sector that will be hit, you can plan for a robust portfolio, which will uh, be able to withstand the vagaries of the market. And so on the eve of March 9th or whatever it was this year, the, the, if the, your client calls and says there is a, a terrible market to event occurring, you're able to take them back to the financial plan and saying, that's okay, we've planned for it. We've planned for your future. We've got cash on the side in case you need have immediate needs. We've got a plan, let's stick to it. Very key reassurance in times of great uncertainty. Yep. <laughs> Reliving, I'm just reliving what uh, my conversation sounded like in March and April, but uh, right, in, right in up that alley. So isn't part of the challenge in general that a lot of consumers just have no idea what financial planning is. They think it's simply running people's investments, right? So if they go to, if they go to someone and look for advice and they get investment advice, a lot of times they think that's what they were looking for in the first place, right? Yeah. So I think most people, if they were explained what financial planning uh, was, would they expect that from all of their advisors, regardless of the designation, regardless of the title, and regardless of the executive thing, whether they're a vice president or a consultant or whatever they are, people go for planning, really, and recommendations coming out of plan. And I think that it's very important for the consumer to have a plan, which is in planning language again. One of my real concerns uh, in a lot of planning that we see is that the big institutions have these template plans. Mm -hmm. and the templates have effectively a thin layer at the beginning and a whole bunch of charts at the back with deep numbers, which are the consumer's own experience, your experience. But the rest of it's all template and in language you can't understand. And I say can't understand because it's a, a lot of in industry jargon, which needs to be defined. Terms which seem to be common sense are not common sense in the financial world. Let me give you an example. Medium risk. Medium <laughs> risk seems like such a simple term, but medium yeah. risk is very much a subjective experience where the advisor has a duty to assess your risk tolerance and not simply to ask you, what is your risk tolerance? If they simply ask you and put down what you say, then they fail to exercise the necessary judgment. You see, there's a real layer of financial acumen that goes behind the simple question. And financial plans should have an explanation of what is meant by the financial planner when they use these terms. Another example is time horizon. Simplest thing is, is that first dollar out or last dollar out? Mm -hmm. You move from what's called the accumulation phase to the deaccumulation. That is really simple. You stop saving and you start drawing down your investments. Well, that's a really big factor. And if that's like most of us, when your risk tolerance changed, then that should be the time horizon, which they have. Often, time horizon moves uh, in different documents between first dollar out and the last dollar out, which is when you expect to run out of money or die, whichever is first. Again, this has to be a meeting of the minds. It has to be explained to you. And the document, the financial plan, should have clear definitions of this so that you and your advisor are on the same page. 
Yep. I mean, unfortunately, financial planning in general has been kind of the free toy at the bottom of the Cracker Jack box or whatever it might be, because it was sold as a add on or value add to the thing that they really cared about, which was the investment management. Now, you know, I've always said, frankly, uh, if you take the opposite viewpoint, you're going to use more likely you're going to manage all their investments in larger ones, too. And, and I've proven that as many others have in their own practices. But, you know, further your your comments about the plan and, and the templated stuff. Yeah. I mean, I often scratch my head as to why people will dump 90 plus page financial plans with every spreadsheet and and uh, form and every projection known to man on people. It's as if it's as if they're trying to justify their their value based on the thickness of the plan itself. Uh, when frankly, I agree with you. If you, the client can understand what it is you're doing and you're not executing on those strategies, then there's really no value to the entire process. Absolutely. And uh, we discussed a little earlier if um, a real uh, crutch used by inexperienced and unprofessional individuals is to use big words and fancy terms. A true leader, a true expert in the area has to be able to communicate, as I've said before, and they can take these complex ideas and communicate them in ordinary, plain language. That's when an advisor is really at the top of the game. It's not the big words. It's not fancy charts. It's not pages upon pages of a run calculation. Unless you are an uh, accountant or somebody with particular financial acumen and you're going to a financial planner, that's the, uh, probably the only time when these fancy charts and these lots of numbers are uh, intelligible to the consumer. For the rest of us. I mean, I often say this is, you know, we overthink these things. You know, you basically, it should be goals and objectives. And you know, first of all, who's the client? Goals and objectives. What's their income and expenses? What are their assets? What's their balance sheet look like? What's the projections of all these recommendations we're making look like? Oh, sorry, as well as what the, what's the portfolio and the risk associated with that? What do the projections look like? And then what are the recommendations? And then if you want to throw a bunch of tables in the back in the appendices after the recommendations, that's fine. But you you really could sum up a financial plan in less than 10 pages, right? And in, in let's call it Absolutely. even five to six. Absolutely. You actually threw in something which is incredibly important and amazingly often not handled properly. Who is the client? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had parents who have had uh, financial uh, holdings and often as they age, the, one of the children steps in and becomes the intermediary, the person who talks to the financial planner, mm -hmm. the financial advisor. Well, that person, that son or daughter is not the client. The client is the parents in that scenario. And you can't confuse the sophistication of the child or the goals of the child or the fact that they may be the planned person who will inherit the money with the client. The client is the parent in that scenario. If it's a trust, it's the trust that's the client. It's not the beneficiaries and it's not the person who is handling the trust. We and must remember who the client is. I would say, actually, that flips around the other way because I've had older clients say to me, well, you know, if if all this money here in this pile is going to be inherited by my kids, and you know, maybe I should take a less conservative approach with that money because it's going to them and they got a longer timeline, to which my response is always, well, that may be where it's going, but you're the client and you're the one who's got to, I got to sit across from should anything go wrong. And, you know, then we have a risk versus reward conversation again and ask, you know, for example, if, if basically I asked them a question of, you know, if this is a million dollars and it was down 200,000, what would you do? Right. It's, so to add to your your conversation there, it's not just about remembering who the client is, but always bringing the the entire context of not who the client is, but also bringing back those other points of conversation, the risk and reward conversations to to that in, in the context of whatever we're addressing. Yeah, very true. It's not wrong for that client being the parent who's funding the inheritance or the trust to decide to take more or less risk, but it should be something that they're comfortable with. And it should always be that in mind when the financial advisor planner talks to that client. Okay. So we've identified three big ones, right? Communication, typically, I like to call it talking over the client as opposed to to them. You're basically just spewing, spewing jargon as a means of trying to prove that you're impressive to the room. Not addressing risk, only looking at the upside, not addressing the, the real challenges on the downside. And, you know, the comprehensive and actual tangible financial planning. Any other red flags people should be looking out for? 
Well, um, as something particularly in these times after uh, uh, winners and losers in the market is um, unexpected volatility and unexpected losses in your portfolio. And if your advisor is either avoiding your calls, that's a big red flag. Or if the advisor is saying, it's just the market, it's not the plan, then that's again, another red flag. They should be able to take you to your plan and show you how the volatility or risk of loss, two different concepts, how they are in your plan and they were discussed with you and you agreed to them. And personally, I think that these things can be uh, uh, shown in a particular chart, which is the uh, to show that if you're talking about the potential gain, also show in the same chart the potential for loss. It, it, there are lots of studies on this, Jason, as you know, about the asymmetric experience of the investor to between gains and losses. Investors expect gains. They expect reasonable gains at a reasonable price. What the advisor's duty is, is to bring them again to the risk, to the potential of loss. And this should be in your financial plan so that you were, that, that there is, again, the, the advisor and the client is on the same page and they both know there is that potential. And particularly if it's a volatility, you know, this line that I said earlier, it's the market, it's not the plan. Well, if it's volatility, but you knew that your investments could be volatile and you had a plan to stick with the investments until a predetermined exit points or a reevaluation point. That's mm -hmm. the benefit of a plan in uncertain markets. Yep, agreed. And it's really not that hard. I mean, we do this in our process as well, and it's, it's straight quite simple. You know, here is what our quote unquote balanced portfolio, for example, looks like. Here is the historical downside, the worst case scenario experienced in the last 40 years. Here's the best case. Here's the average. Know that this sort of thing is not beyond the realm of reason. It is very possible that you will see one a, a drop within that normal, within that historical range to that downside within the, your lifetime of investing, if not multiple times, right? And I always just have them do a visioning exercise where we basically say, you have X amount invested with me. You open up the statement and it says you've lost this much. What is your reaction? Because if your re reaction is, well, I'm going to cash out or I'm going to fire you or do whatever else, then this is not the right solution for you, quite honestly. Very sensible. You also should see diversification for most of us in our plans. And diversification is not just simply diversification among your invested assets in the market. But let me give you an example. We've seen a lot of cases coming out of uh, the uh, Alberta oil and gas market. And of course, we know that oil and gas is boom and bust. We also know that a lot of people have a very significant part of their net worth in their home. And if you're in Alberta, your homes and your vacation properties are likely, if they're in Alberta, are likely to uh, fluctuate along with the oil and gas market. So mm -hmm. you can't say that that is a diversified portfolio if you have a whole bunch of the bigger oil and gas companies, you have banks which are closely correlated with the oil and gas market, and you have real estate in the area which could be influenced by oil and gas market. Diversification has to look at the whole plan's diversification and not just invested assets. Another area of red flag. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a term called human capital, which not, you know, I would say, unfortunately, the industry does not pay anywhere near enough attention to. The simple rule, I mean, what comes down to it is, do you really want to have a lot of comp a lot of money in your company stock when all of your, which is quote unquote your financial capital, when your human capital, which is your ability to earn income, is tied to the same company? You know, the probability of of that stock being down at the same time you lose your job are pro is probably pretty high. And that's not looking at diversification. I mean, we think about diversification. We think about stocks, bonds, global, you know, internationally, and across sectors. But there's an entire it goes beyond that. It's it's what else is happening in that person's life. And that's what you're getting at. So lack of consideration for the human capital and other financial capital that might be tied to their human capital. Anything else you want to you want to add? Another a good example is uh, if myself, I'm a businessman, I'm in law, but I take a lot of what's called contingent retainers, paid when get pay, uh, pay, uh, pay when get paid. And there's risk in my uh, business. Not unusual for a business owner to have risk in their business. And because of 
the risk, which is I can invest well in my business where I'm very knowledgeable and uh, can and can really feel and experience the risk and pr predict to some degree how to respond. When I take my money off that table, that is my business table, and put it into investment, I have to take into account that I've got a lot of risk already in my portfolio, and that's my business portfolio. So I want very low risk in my investments because I can't really afford to take risk in those. I take risk where I can make a difference. Now, that's uh, something which I've actually, using myself as an example again, had a great deal of problems with some financial advisors and their dealerships who say, well, Mr. Geller, you're uh, 55 years old, you're highly educated, you have a high income, you have knowledge of the markets and investing for a long time, therefore, you should be medium to high risk because you've got at least 10 years till your retirement goal. And I say, that's absolutely the wrong analysis for mm -hmm. a financial planner. I don't need to gamble more. I'll gamble where I think I control outcomes or at least control factors related to the income. I'm not going to take gambles in the market, which I know I'm a guppy in, even though I've been investing since I was a kid, even though I uh, work in this area. I know it's a crapshoot what's going to happen on any investment that I do unless I de-risk it down to a real minimum that I can pallet and go to sleep at night. And it's, uh, again, so now we're actually talking about the second dimension of human capital, which is the volatility of that capital. And, and for those who want to learn more about this, uh, the book, is Are You a Stock or a Bond? by Moshe Malevsky, a friend, mentor, and former professor of mine, specifically addresses this in very easy to understand parlance. But when you're, one you know, we talked about- Jump in there, Jason, because yeah. that has got one of the best books for people interested in their own investment, because what it does, it, it takes you away from the complex analysis that few of us have the uh, mathematical background to do and talks in common sense about UCO and about how you, uh, your risk tolerance should change over your lifetime as you go through lifetime events. It's an excellent book, and I'm sure he's a great man. I am. Uh, he is a fantastic one and fantastic professor. And uh, I will plug this book. I am conflicted. Um, so you can take my word for it. Uh, I would not just say this about anyone, but great book. But exactly right. I mean, you know, that, let's just look at this in, in, in parts. It's funny because you just actually tweeted uh, something recently about about uh, are you a stock or a bond? And the example we always use is if you're a tenured professor, your money is as close to government bond like as possible, right? Because you pretty much can't be fired with the exception of, you know, basically doing something really wrong. And you can pretty much count on that income coming in every year, no problem. If on the opposite of the spectrum, I think, you know, let's just say, for example, um, you're a mutual fund manager who manages nothing but equity, uh, one, one type of equity fund in one sector, right? And your, your salary is based solely on the performance within that sector. Just normal performance of the market. So, Comparatively to that professor, let's say that you are an equity fund manager, right? And you basically make money based on the performance or the assets under management. Well, let's just say it's all performance. Well, that is the purest form of, of quote unquote stock like income. So your 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 income is highly volatile. And when what the argument is is that with human capital is that you should consider what the allocation is in terms of industry and other factors, as well as volatility into the grand scheme of things in conjunction with your investments, right? And I'll often find, more often than not, there's a familiarity bias problem that people have. So for example, you, you mentioned the, the oil and gas people, right? People who make their living in oil and gas love to believe in investing with nothing but oil and gas. People who, who work in technology love to invest in nothing but technology. But those are really, really, really highly correlated outcomes. And just regular cyclicality can, can be devastating. And it's not, again, if you're an advisor who's not taking this into consideration, then quite frankly, you're, you're negligent. And that said, I mean, everybody lies on the spectrum somewhere. You know, we can assume the average person somewhere in the average middle, but for those who are on the, on the polls, it really needs to be a consideration. Yes. I think this familiarity bias is, is, is um, a real opportunity for the advisor to show their mettle. And I'm not looking for a yes man or a chairman leader to be uh, my advisor. I want somebody who's going to back me up, make me look at the basics and talk to me about some risks in my assumptions when I may have, of course, their assumptions. I may have glossed over them. And the tendency to go with what you know 
and uh, where you think you have a, a strategic advantage, it's maybe true in business, but in the stock market, it's rarely true. In fact, it tends to, uh, the studies sh show, look at overconfidence and be inversely correlated. Your belief is inversely correlated to your ability to pick and predict outcomes. Mm, agreed. So, okay, not taking into consideration both dimensions of human capital, uh, comprehensiveness, lack of comprehensiveness, not discussing risk, poor communication, any other kind of just general red flags? Not that I can think of right now, but as we speak, okay. I'm sure I'll call another more red flag. Fair um, but, I, but if your accountant is calling you up and saying, did you know you had losses and you didn't, that's a red flag. Fair enough. Well, I mean, well, let me take it. Let me ask you in, in a different context. If, they're, if the person is acting as a portfolio manager and is tax loss harvesting throughout the year, that would not necessarily be a red flag, would it? As long as the tax loss harvesting as a concept was communicated to them. Well, yes, as long as what they're not doing is as a strategy, in effect, selling the winners and keeping the losers on the books and every once in a while uh, doing a little bit of tax loss selling at the end of the year just to be able to say they're doing so. So the red flag is associated with the regular sales of things for profit. But what your balance sheet is holding or your portfolio is holding more and more is things with losses. So, OK, the um, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, how you know people will avoid selling things that are losers to to basically not have to take that loss and look bad to the client. I, I never really experienced that before. I guess I don't think that was. Um, <laughs> but you imagine I see the worst things, uh, as we said at the beginning. I can be a cheerleader for those who do it right. Fair enough. So, OK, you're you find out you're with the wrong advisor. The first thing to do is always just change advisors. Right. You know, you have that option. You can always have a conversation with them to make sure your expectations of them are correct. But change advisors is an option. When does it cross the line into something that there is recourse for the consumer? So. I start by looking at the documents themselves and look at what the records show. And these aren't just the records that are in the hand of the client, because the client really only sees the tip of the iceberg. And they often are in the worst position to actually judge whether the uh, advisor did what was required under highly regulated and sometimes fairly complex requirements. So just to give an example of that, a client may have a really had a really good relationship with a advisor where they thought that the advisor was always doing what was proper. This is in what is called a non-discretionary account, meaning an account which the advisor isn't the portfolio manager, doesn't have the discretion to make all decisions. But really, the advisor just phones up and says, I really like a Bank of Montreal. Let's put 50000 in. Well, the client may think that that was an authorized trade if they say, yes, in fact, that was a breach of fundamental rules because there were four requirements, two of which were not covered in that conversation, as I just laid it out. So that means that the trade was not properly authorized. And if there was a loss associated with it, there is both a regulatory complaint and a potential claim for compensation. We look at a couple of things when we're uh, filtering through to see which claims we'd recommend going forward on. First of all, we look for capital loss, not just opportunity loss, unless it's a very long time frame. We look at capital loss. The second thing we look for is whether the financial plan was objectively suitable for the investor. And so we then compare what was objectively suitable against what occurred. And we look for then, is there losses associated with any of those failures of in planning? If there are the connection of the loss with a problem that caused the loss, then we have two of the three elements for commencing the claim. The third actually is just timeliness. Once you knew or ought to have known, that your advisor failed you, that they caused losses, and this was a result of mistakes made by the advisor or breaches of rules, very uh, much rarer that people know where the breaches of rules, but those, they know what was caused, uh, the damages were caused by that, then they have to sue within two years. They have six years to go to the Ombudsman of Banking Services and that's but only two years to commence a lawsuit. 
And the lawsuit, I said that the key element of the legal definition of timing, consider it like a light bulb turning on. So many consumers may say, well, I thought I was supposed to be invested in secure, safe investment, and I lost money. But the advisor said that was the market. I didn't really think anything more was wrong until I learned that the advisor was in trouble with the regulator, or I spoke to another advisor and they said, no, 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 you, the investments were never suitable for you. That is suitable being a regulatory breach. It's from that point, when you realize that light bulb turns on and you realize that there was a breach and it caused your damages, then you have to sue within two years. So what we recommend is if you're not sure, first of all, get a second opinion from somebody who's not at the same institution and is independent and ideally has good credentials of the financial planner. And then if they think there was a wrong done to you, then promptly reach out to a lawyer who has experience in the area. Many lawyers can sue and they can do it competently, but there are some hurdles in specific areas, be it construction law, medical malpractice, or financial loss. And you have to understand the products and the obligations of the advisor to be able, to, uh, as a lawyer, to give a good opinion on whether or not there is a meritorious claim and financially, it makes sense to pursue that goal. It's interesting. Like those are, I'd say, failures of duty. I mean, there's also the more obvious things that cross the line into cross the line into borderline theft or negligence. But Absolutely. I think those are a little bit more obvious when when people go looking for them that that might be the case. So really, what it comes down to is, in, in a number of ways, failure to communicate action, failure to provide proper due diligence for the client in regards to recommendations made in light of their situation. And I guess that's, you know, and I, I guess that's, and then timeliness it really is, is what it comes down to. Yes. And okay. so firms like ourselves, well, there's not many firms, but the firms that do this uh, area like ourselves, we get a lot of claims uh, or calls at least for potential claims. And just to give you an idea, in the first phone call, which I don't charge for unless we get retained, um, we turn away somewhere between two and three or three and four initial calls, because we're able to bear through the information and give a quick opinion on whether it's timely, or whether it sounds like there are breaches that are meritorious, and whether the losses are sufficient to justify the trauma involved, being involved in the lawsuit, the stress, as well as the potential costs. Even if you're doing it on a contingency retainer. There are cost risks. And so you don't sue for $50,000 of loss. You go to the ombudsman for something like that. It's not worth the cost of the lawyers to sue for that. I know it's a lot of money to a lot of people, but $50,000 when compared against legal fees just isn't a good risk. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure you got a number of you know, complaints that are basically like my advisor lost me 10%. It's completely within normal, normal guidelines. And it was, I'm sure there's plenty of cases you come across where someone's just content and it's not necessarily a violation of the advisor's duty. It might be, but it might not be. I'm sure you have to focus through that. So it's not just about losing money. It's about losing the money in the context of the grander scheme of things, really. Absolutely. You know, particularly if you have a down market, like in March, when we got calls in March, unless there was a clear technical breach of people who were more looking for, they were more sophisticated, then we said, follow your financial advice for a while and let's see what happens. Because in times of volatility, people get very nervous, but they don't necessarily have losses and they don't necessarily have claims. Fair. So one last question for you to, to, to add to this. So we've discussed knowing the difference between good and bad advice and what to do when advice goes bad. But unfortunately, the amount of due diligence that the average person puts into getting an advisor, I'd say is pretty slim to my experience, right? The, you know, more often than not, it's someone they know recommended someone that, they, that they're, they're working with. And just because that person is happy with that advisor doesn't mean that advisor is doing a good job. There's, you know, the do you know what you should know of that person? So the, the questions I have for you really is, the consumers listening to this, what steps should they take when deciding to work with an advisor? Like, what should they be looking out for? 
in oh. terms of who they should be working with? Well, this is a very difficult question, and it shouldn't. It, it's something which, as an uh, investor advocate, I'm very disappointed in the way I'm going to answer the question, because I think that the investor is entitled to clear and easily accessible. There are a few things which can, they can look to. First of all, they can do internet searches and particularly look at, if you're looking for mutual funds, whether the, the Mutual Fund Dealers Association, if it's securities, look at the um, Investment Industry Regulator of Canada, Insurance, Financial Services Regulator Agency in, in Ontario at least, and look at these regulators and see whether there are any enforcement actions or decisions against the financial advisor, and also take a look at the firm uh, that they're associated with. Unfortunately, you won't see everything which is known to be bad about the, guy, about the advisor if there are things to know, be known. So that's a limit. You can look at credentials. There are some credentials that indicate higher qualifications, higher thresholds. And let's be clear, the threshold to become a financial advisor just without the higher threshold, the credentials, is so low that in grade 13, I qualify. I had never had, had a checkbook that I had to balance. I had never had a lease for a car or a house. I had never had a uh, real job. And yet I could advise on investments. That's how low the entry standards are. And insurance isn't much better. So look for things like CFA, CLUs, although that's not a guarantee, registered financial planners, certified financial planners. These are some of the qualifications which are a higher studying standard and actually a higher standard of continuing practice. There are also people who, that I just listed who have planning backgrounds and whether they're, uh, you're looking for wealth planning, estate planning, retirement planning, financial planning, really what you're looking for is somebody with good planning background so that they have the skills and have shown the skills to independent third parties that they can bring to your particular future. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And it's interesting. I mean, you made a number of points I want to kind of just um, expand upon. Mm -hmm. You know, the entire look at the individual, not the firm. I mean, too often, you know, there's, I like to say, people get washed with the logo. And really, in actuality, advisors run their own more or less independent practices, regardless of the logo that's that's over top. So as I always say, you know, you could be dealing with a bank owned brokerage and you might be dealing with the the best guy they have or the worst guy they have, but they had the same business card. So it's, it's really hard to tell. Um, Let me in there for a moment. Uh, in, in fact, some of the worst financial planning that I've seen, some of the worst service and some of the worst customer service following what is clearly breaches is by the biggest bank associated dealers. So logo is not in any way a marker of either service, qualifications, or if there's a problem, how you'll be treated. Oh, actually, so it's interesting you say that. So first of all, thank you for that, uh, because that is absolutely true. And to my experience, we never lose people to those to those groups, and we end up taking tremendous amounts of business from them, because you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, they're there to meet the needs of the bank, which are not the needs of the client. And actually, the entire security aspect, where some people feel they're more secure for dealing with a larger institution, I actually say it's the other way around. They're more likely to bury you in legal in lawyers and paperwork if you ever complain. Um, and about the highest fees often. It's amazing how multi-million yeah. dollars accounts are being asked to pay 1.5% for a non-trading account, but something that is going to be a buy and hold strategy. And yet oh, yeah. paying for the nose way higher than they have to if the client knew to negotiate the right down. Yeah. It's, just, it's terrible. And more often than not, like for lack of a better term, you know, the inmates are running the asylum. It's the investment guys running the relationship, not the planners. So really, you know, they're only there for they're there for one thing. Planning is the freebie that they give you. And those those planning groups are also incredibly restricted in some of the stuff that they can say or not say because That's they can't they can't contract the advisor. Right. So if the advisor doesn't want the recommendation there because it contract because it's going to cost them money, then in terms of running the assets, sales channel, not the professional advice channel. Oh, exactly. I could beat up on the banks all day. Maybe I'll do a special episode about that, but let's not let's not go that way. The other thing it's it's a, a funny. You know, just to give you some guidelines as to what I you know what we do as a best practice in three in three specific ways that I think are valuable to consumers. One, 
we never make recommendations until we've done planning. Uh, you know, Josh Brown at the U.S. is a well-known financial planner, financial advisor, basically said to make an investment recommendation without having a financial plan is akin to malpractice. And I, that's one of my favorite quotes ever. And I, I feel the same way. I don't understand how anyone can make recommendations on investments without having a plan in place and then having the investment policy statement, or just simply what that means in layman's terms is this is how your investments are going to help you meet your goals laid out in the plan, how those two things cannot be done in conjunction before the money gets invested. Yet, meanwhile, it happens all the time. We're in competition for business where a prospect will come in and we'll give them that response. They'll be like, huh, the other guys listened to me talk for 15 minutes and then said, this is what I'm going to invest you in and pulled out some sheet out of their, out of their uh, folder. And it's like, and we're just like, does that make any sense to you after we just explained our process? And they're like, no, no, it most certainly does not. So to those advisors out there listening to this, you're not actually winning business because of that behavior. You're losing it. And it's, and, and frankly, it's just one of those rare instances we're doing the right thing. Well, this is one of those instances in life. We're doing the right, right thing is actually what's going to win. Yeah. But Jason, you and I know, and your, your listeners should know, that often the financial advisor is not required to do a plan. So they can get away with it and save a lot of money by pumping what they have to sell. Yep. So more and often than not, or oftentimes those plans are designed to do nothing but sell. Right? Yes. They're, they're, they're designed to sell an insurance policy. I've seen that on countless occasions. Yes. And if they're promising you a, 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 a result, well, nobody has a crystal ball. Not a planner, not a financial advisor, and not the guy who's some stock jockey. They're just taking risk with your money. Agreed. And the other two pieces of advice we give is that we always tell people that we have other clients who are willing to act as, uh, you know, to basically act as references. We also, if they want to see sample financial plans, we have those available. And lastly, we often get times, sometimes we'll get people who are, who are the only people they spoke, person they've spoken to, and we'll say, okay, so your primary job is to go out now and talk to at least two other people before you make a decision. Because all too often, I mean, frankly, you know, Frankly, if you only talk, if you only talk to one person, how do you know that person is any good, right? Well, yeah. that's, that's that's nuts to me. And we'll even we'll even make recommendations as to other credible people that they should consider or talk to. And uh, more often than not, they're you know I think people are not used to that kind of candor and that kind of of genuineness. So it plays you know sometimes maybe maybe we won't win that business, but if they end up in, a, in the place they should be, that's really the goal. We'll be fine in the long run. You know, you've probably heard my speech, which is uh, professionalism is a sales advantage. What you're describing is professionalism. Yeah. And it's a great way of presenting your offer. If you're telling people the risks, if you're saying to them, do your own due diligence, check me out, then um, uh, 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 that is the marks of a professional. So I wrote about it years ago, and it was something to, uh, to, the, uh, to the level of disclosure of compensation should not be a strategic advantage. Unfortunately, in the current industry, it is. And simply stating that this is something other piece of advice for clients. If the advisor is not willing to tell you in full and complete simple terms, what it is you're paying in percentages and dollars, and you basically, if giving that to another advisor, that advisor doesn't basically un uncover some sort of hidden fee that you were not disclosed. Like if you cannot know with certainty what it is you're paying and they can't look in the eyes and tell you what it is, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And it should, uh, for, for those of us who basically are transparent about this, the number of relationships I've destroyed with previous advisors by just telling people what they were being paid, what they were paying their advisor is astonishing. And I often wonder, like, how do you get up every day and avoid this conversation? I like, think it's it, value in financial planning. It's worth paying for financial planning. But if you're not getting that financial planning, then it comes down to disclosure and competitive pricing. And the correct. compounding impact of fees is the same as the compounding impact of interest, just the inverse. So I have no problem with paying a higher fee if you're getting the full suite of services. Otherwise, you're just talking about trying to reduce your cost. That's it. And if you, you know, exactly, if that person, you know, if that advisor is just pointing to an investment, telling you where to go, you're better off with a robo-advisor. If you yep. actually, to compare, and, and then comparing the price of a robo-advisor to a fully comprehensive planner, there is a gap there. There is a definite margin, but that margin needs to be earned. And you know, frankly, if you're not, if you're, if you're just this, the product salesperson hoping for that margin, yeah, something's wrong. Something's wrong, and that's not a lot of value to add, quite honestly. Good portion of the industry. Yeah, unfortunately, it is. But you know, hopefully, things are changing slowly. Yeah. So, Harold, 
thank you so much for taking the time today. I very much appreciate it. Where can people find you? Well, uh, there are only three uh, Harold Gellers on the internet. I'm not an astrophysicist and I'm not in the movie, but my, uh, my website is www.financialloss, one word, dot C-A. And I'm at H Geller, G-E-L-L-E-R, at NBC Law. That's Mary Betty Charlie, Law, dot C-A. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. And uh, keep up the good work. It's very important that people become educated on the value of planning. This is Appreciate one of those. Thank you. So that was my interview with Harold Geller. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I hope you have a better idea now of what separates a good from bad advisor. And if you're in a situation with a bad one, get out. If you're in the market for a good one, hopefully this serves as a guidepost. And if you're someone who's had the unfortunate happen to them with their advisor, Harold is a wonderful gentleman to speak to about that specific problem. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe